The Subcommittee on Civil Rights and Human Services will come to order. Welcome everyone. I note that a quorum is present. The subcommittee is meeting today to hear testimony on examining the policies and priorities of the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Food and Nutrition Service. This is an entirely remote hearing. All microphones will be kept muted as a general rule to avoid unnecessary background noise. Members and witnesses will be responsible for unmuting themselves when they are recognized to speak or when they wish to seek recognition. I also ask that members please identify themselves before they speak. Members should keep their cameras on while in the proceeding. Members shall be considered present in the proceeding when they are visible on camera, and they shall be considered not present when they are not visible on camera. The only exception to this is if they are, if they are experiencing technical difficulty and inform committee staff of such difficulty. If any member experiences technical difficulties during the hearing, you should stay connected on the platform, make sure you are muted, and use your phone to immediately call the committee's IT director whose number was provided in advance. Should the chair experience technical difficulty or need to step away to vote on the floor, Mrs. Hayes or another majority member is hereby authorized to assume the gavel in the chair's absence. This is an entirely remote hearing, and as such, the committee's hearing room is officially closed. Members who choose to sit with their individual devices in the hearing room must wear headphones to avoid feedback, echoes, and distortion resulting from more than one person on the software platform sitting in the same room. Members are also expected to adhere, adhere to social distancing and safe health care guidelines, including the use of masks, hand sanitizer, and wiping down their areas both before and after their presence in the hearing room. To ensure that the committee's five minute rule is adhered to, staff will be keeping track of the time using the committee's field timer, which appears in its own thumbnail picture and will be named 001 timer. There will be no one minute warning. The field timer will show a blinking light. When time is up, members and witnesses are asked to wrap up promptly when their time has expired. Although a roll call is not necessary, to establish a quorum in an official proceeding conducted remotely or with participation, the committee has made it a practice whenever there is an official proceeding with remote participation for the clerk to call the roll to help make clear who is present at the start of the proceeding. Members should say their name before announcing they are present. This helps the clerk and also helps those watching the platform and the live stream who may experience a few seconds delay. So at this time, I ask the clerk to call the roll. Chair Bonamici. Chair Bonamici is present. Ms. Adams. Ms. Adams. Mrs. Hayes. Adams is present. Mrs. Hayes. Present. Ms. Leger Fernandez. Leger Fernandez is present. Mr. Mervan. Frank Mervan is present. Mr. Bowman. Mr. Umfume. Mr. Scott. That is present. Ranking member Fulcher. Fulcher is present. Mr. Thompson. Ms. McLean. Mrs. Sparks. Mr. Fitzgerald. Here. Mrs. Fox. Here. Chair Bonamici, that concludes the roll call. Thank you. Pursuant to committee rule 8C, we are going to do opening statements, which are limited to the chair and ranking member. This allows us to hear from our witness sooner and provides all members with adequate time to ask questions. I recognize myself now for the purpose of making an opening statement. I wanna start by thanking the committee and personal staff for their work on this uh, committee hearing, subcommittee hearing. We are holding this hearing today to learn about and discuss the Biden administration's priorities for federal child nutrition programs and the steps we should take to prevent children and families from going hungry during the pandemic and beyond. 
I want to thank Deputy Undersecretary Dean for being with us today. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused an unprecedented number of children across the country to go hungry. Widespread school closures combined with the economic crisis created a nightmare scenario in which hunger among children and families surged to unprecedented levels. Even before the pandemic, too many children did not have access to healthy food. In 2018, nearly one in every seven households with children struggled to put enough food on the table. Unfortunately, just weeks into the pandemic, more than one in every three households with children and nearly half of all mothers with young children struggled with food insecurity. By mid-July, as many as 17 million children were not getting enough to eat because their families could not afford it. I will say that again, less than a year ago, nearly 17 million children were not getting enough to eat. This crisis has been far worse for the families, many of them families of color, who were already food insecure when the pandemic started. During the early stages of the pandemic, both Latin and Latinx families experienced food insecurity at twice the rate of white families. These numbers should alarm all of us. Children who go hungry are far more vulnerable to chronic health challenges and without access to healthy food, children struggle to build the foundation they need to learn, grow, and lead a fulfilling life. Last year, Congress acted swiftly to expand access to nutrition assistance as schools across the country closed. One of the first relief packages, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, gave the USDA critical flexibility to allow schools and community partners to deliver meals to families and offer free meals to all children through the Summer Food Service Program. Families First also included bipartisan legislation I led to eliminate other barriers to providing nutrition assistance. The bill also created the Pandemic EBT Program, or PEBT, so low-income families who could not physically get to school mail sites could still receive funding to help feed their children. I have visited with a dedicated staff at Aloha Huber Park Elementary School and Hayhurst Elementary School in Northwest Oregon. I spoke with the administrators, I spoke with the staff and the families about how these programs help meet the needs of students and families. These investments have made a significant difference for families in Oregon and across the country. Research indicates that PEBT has lifted as many as 3.9 million children out of hunger. And recent reporting indicates that the share of Americans struggling with hunger is now at its lowest level since the pandemic started. Despite our progress, we know that too many children are still going to bed hungry. But the clear lesson from our successful efforts to bolster nutrition assistance programs is that when we provide people in need with relief, they use those resources to feed their families. Fortunately, the American Jobs Plan includes important investments in school kitchens, and the American Families Plan would invest $43 billion in our federal child nutrition programs. We should swiftly advance these bills. The American Families Plan also makes permanent and nationwide the summer EBT program which already provides food assistance to some families during the summer months. This program will help feed children across the country at a time when they are not getting healthy school meals. The package also expands the popular community eligibility provision or CEP. This expansion would feed roughly 9.3 million more children by making them eligible for free school meals. Moving forward, the committee must also update the underlying laws that authorize our federal child nutrition programs. They have, not, they have been expired since 2015. The last child nutrition reauthorization, which Congress passed in 2010 with bipartisan support, dramatically expanded access to child nutrition programs. We should work together again to renew these critical laws. This hearing is an opportunity to examine these steps with Deputy Undersecretary Dean and to consider the future of child nutrition as we recover from the pandemic. How will our five or 10 year outlook change if we confront the child hunger crisis now? I look forward to discussing these issues and the work we have ahead to make sure that all children in this country can access the healthy food they need to thrive. Thank you again to Deputy Undersecretary 
Dean, for being with us today. And I now want to turn to Ranking Member Fulcher to make an opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. The school meal program is one of the most important programs this committee oversees. If students are hungry, they don't learn. If they don't learn, they don't succeed in school. This impacts their prospects for a successful career as adults. As I dig into this issue and hear more from my constituents on these programs, the best thing we can do is ensure this program works up and down the pipeline for those it's intended to serve. When I say up and down the pipeline, I mean from production to consumption. Our nation's parents, farmers, ranchers, food producers, school districts, and school nutrition experts all play a critical role in the success of these programs. It's our job as elected officials to make sure the program aligns with what parents approve of and what farmers can produce to ensure we are able to buy healthy, safe, and tasty food for students and maintain requirements that are easily implemented in real school settings. If the standards are unattainable or overly complicated, the program will fail. Nutrition officials from school districts around my state tell me one of the challenges they face while striving to put together nutritional enjoyable choices for students is following the unclear, complicated federal rules. To that point, let me quickly discuss the sodium targets in the current regulations. I'll chalk this up as a noble goal that doesn't thoroughly account for the reality on the ground. Under target two of the sodium requirements, grades K through five can have no more than 935 milligrams of sodium for lunch. If target three is enacted, sodium would be reduced to 640 milligrams. American Heart Association re released a sample menu of what further reducing the sodium might look like. Not surprising, the meals become far less appealing. To meet target three sodium requirements, schools must eliminate the cheese from a cheeseburger, mix the pickles, and trade the potatoes for carrots. Does a plain hamburger patty with no condiments, no bun, and a side of carrots sound enticing to any of us, much less a school-aged child? Hardly. Pushing for standards that don't meet the reality on the ground will accomplish nothing because kids simply won't eat the food. While schools have done an unbelievable job of working to implement the Healthy Hunger-Free Kids Act standards since they went into effect, serving more fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and less fat, calories, and sodium than ever before, the final sodium targets are unworkable given the other requirements they must meet when serving meals. One cannot cram idealism into lunch programs and pretend the problem solved. The so-called American Families Plan includes a vague program proposal that gives a billion dollars to groups to, that push unworkable school meal standards. Before we create a new expensive program that could sow confusion that burden schools, we should assess our existing programs and look at how they can be adopted to meet their intended goals. One issue that deserves a closer look is nutrition education. How can we support local schools as they work with families to promote better nutrition? For example, how can we utilize programs like Team Nutrition, Farm to School, and others to spark student interest to help them Take what they learn about food production, food business, and food preparation and share it at home. What kind of partnerships with grocers, farmers, and others can we look at to close the circle to help support healthy eating at home? These are questions we should consider as we thoughtfully reauthorize this program. As we look towards reauthorization, Congress must understand what the school meal program will look like in the coming school years with the changes that come from the new COVID and health-related issues, such as a meal service or food preparation. I'm glad to see the secretary provided some certainty for schools in the upcoming summer and school year as they reopen and determine how to serve meals to students. However, if we limit our reauthorization efforts to the status quo, we hinder the ability of schools to provide healthy, tasty meals to students. There are many more programs I could touch on today, but this is just the beginning of the reauthorization process, and I appreciate Deputy Undersecretary for joining us. I would be remiss if I did not mention it's unfortunate these that this is not a full committee hearing, as I think a reauthorization such as this deserves a full committee's attention. Nonetheless, I look forward to hearing your testimony. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Fulcher. Without objection, all other members who wish to insert written statements into the record may do so by submitting them to the committee clerk electronically in Microsoft Word format by 5 p.m. on May 26, 2021. I will now introduce the witness. Stacey Dean was appointed by President Biden to serve as the Deputy Undersecretary for USDA's Food, Nutrition, and Consumer Services, where she will work to advance the President's agenda on increasing nutrition assistance for struggling families and individuals, as well as tackling systemic, systemic racism and barriers to opportunity that have denied so many the chance to get ahead. Prior to joining President Biden's team at USDA, 
Dean served as the Vice President for Food Assistance Policy at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, CBPP. She directed CBPP's Food Assistance Team, which published frequent reports on how federal nutrition programs affect families and communities and developed policies to improve them. We appreciate the witness for participating today and look forward to your testimony. Let me remind you that we have read your written statement and it will appear in full in the hearing record. Pursuant to committee rule 8D and committee practice, you are asked to limit your oral presentation to a five minute summary of your written statement. Before you begin your testimony, please remember to unmute your microphone. During your testimony, staff will be keeping track of time and a light will blink when time is up. Please be attentive to the time uh, and wrap up when your time is over and remute your microphone. And as I explained before the hearing began, I'm gonna be a little lenient with a with a Deputy Undersecretary Dean in terms of timing as uh, she's the only witness today. Uh, but um, I will be pretty strict about the five minutes just so we can get through everybody for questions. If you experience any technical difficulties during your testimony or later in the hearing, you should stay connected on the platform. Make sure you're muted and use your phone to call the committee's IT director whose number was provided in advance. We will let the witness make a presentation before we move to member questions. When answering a question, please remember to unmute your microphone. And the witness is aware of her responsibility to provide accurate information to the subcommittee. And therefore, we will proceed with her testimony. And I now recognize Deputy Undersecretary Dean. Thank you, Madam Chair, Mr. Ranking Member, and subcommittee members. I'm Stacey Dean, uh, USDA's Deputy Undersecretary for Food, Nutrition, and Consumer Services. And I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you about USDA's Child Nutrition and WIC programs today. I also want to begin by acknowledging what a harrowing year it's been for families with children. At the peak last December, nearly one in seven households and more than one in six households with children reported not having enough to eat. Fortunately, the collective efforts of Congress and the administration, including the American Rescue Plan, have delivered help, which has brought meaningful reductions in reported food insecurity. But even the latest reports show that about one in nine households with children reported food hardship, with rates more than twice as high among Black and Hispanic households as compared to white households. It's imperative that we work together to continue to reduce food hardship and improve nutrition security. And in that vein, I'd like to share a few of our key priorities. Uh, first, we're proposing to make nationwide summer EBT permanent. Too many children face a summer hunger gap, but we know how to solve this problem. Where results from our summer EBT pilot study show that providing low-income families with resources to purchase nutritious food during the summer improves children's food insecurity and diet quality. I applaud your foresight for uh, extending PEBT into the summer during the months of the pandemic. For the first time, children eligible for free and reduced price meals nationwide will receive EBT cards in the summer to help address the summer hunger problem. But summer hunger won't disappear when the pandemic ends. That's why the Families Plan invests over $25 billion in a permanent nationwide summer EBT, providing $75 per low-income child per month for food. This is an evidence-based approach that would bring forward and cement this effective anti-hunger policy. Second, we're proposing to expand the reach of the school meal environment in high-need schools. The community eligibility provision allows high-poverty schools to offer all meals at no charge to their students. Uh, this increases student participation in the program and allows schools to focus on serving healthy, nutritious meals instead of uh, paperwork. The successful option was uh, before the pandemic in over 30,000 schools with nearly 15 million children. The Families Plan would allow more high poverty schools into the option with a focus on elementary schools. It would also expand direct enrollment into school meals for children uh, already participating in Medicaid and SSI, easing paperwork for parents that have already taken pains to prove their children's income eligibility. Together, this $17 billion investment would enable an additional 20,000 schools in high poverty areas that serve more than 9 million children to begin providing all meals free of charge. Third, we will continue to improve nutrition security through the Child Nutrition and Work programs. Today, one in five American children are obese. 
increasing their risk of adult obesity and nutrition-related health conditions, as well as potential financial burdens on our healthcare system. Evidence shows that strong nutrition uh, standards make an important difference. With research shows not only its powerful impacts on birth outcomes, but also that the updated food package standards help to improve weight status in young children. Now, some controversy around the implementation of some school meal standards has somewhat obscured the huge strides in making meals healthier over the past decade. A USDA study found that under the new standards, school meals include more vegetables, whole grains, and dairy, and less refined grains and empty calories than before with improvements um, experienced across racial and socioeconomic groups, which is great news for our children's health. School meals are the healthiest eating environment in the country, and that's a success we should build on. We'll continue these gains by setting and maintaining strong evidence-based standards, but we will pair them with realistic and achievable timelines for reaching them, and with the support schools need to serve nutritious meals that kids enjoy. The Families Plan also includes $1 billion to help schools expand healthy offerings beyond the required standards and to test and evaluate strategies for encouraging healthy lifestyles. This would support local innovation to enhance school food environments. Fourth, we will increase access to WIC with the goal of improving maternal and child health across racial and ethnic lines. The share of eligible families receiving WIC's proven benefits has declined to only about 50%. We'll invest the $390 million Congress provided through the rescue plan in robust outreach to reach more eligibles, as well as grants to support efforts to improve WIC service delivery, improve equity, and reduce health disparities. And last, let me flag that we're very aware that the committee will be working on the president's proposal for historic investments in childcare for working families. We hope to work with you on how these proposals can leverage our highly successful child and adult care food program to reach new child care providers. This nutrition program supports high quality care by providing nutritious meals to our youngest children. So of course the list I've just provided doesn't cover all of the advancements that we hope to make and that I expect you'll be considering. But so I look forward to our conversation today and our ongoing work together. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And now under committee rule 9A, we will question the witness under the five minute rule. I'll be recognizing subcommittee members in seniority order. Again, to ensure that the five minute rule is adhered to, staff will keep track of time and the timer will show a blinking light when the time has expired. Please be attentive to the time, wrap up when your time is over and remute your microphone. As chair, I recognize myself for five minutes. And um, under secretary Terry Dean, I have three questions. So I'm gonna state them all now and then give you time to respond. First, under the Trump administration, Oregon was removed from the summer EBT demonstration program. I'm grateful that the Biden administration has proposed making summer EBT nationwide and permanent. What will this policy mean to families who will now be able to rely on help with groceries during the summer? The second question is, in the American Rescue Plan, President Biden laid out key investments in childcare. Our committee, the, our committee recently heard testimony from Mr. Rashid Malik, an early childhood policy expert who emphasized the importance of the child and adult care food program. So what improvements could Congress make to CACFP to better support the childcare infrastructure? Do you agree with Mr. Malik and with me that CACFP should provide reimbursement for a third meal to children in full day care. And then finally, the WIC Farmers Market Nutrition Program provides a great opportunity to connect pregnant women and young children to healthy local produce. And it also supports our farmers. What flexibilities did the Families First Coronavirus Act provide to WIC FMNP? And how can the program operate most effectively moving forward? And I'm gonna give you the rest of the time to respond. Well, thank you for that. All right, that was, um, that's the list, all right. So let's begin with uh, summer EBT. Um, you asked me what the impact of having the national program would be. And I'd say first, um, to respond to your example about Oregon, states will no longer have to apply to be part of a demo that's very limited and typically sub-state. This will be a nationwide policy that will apply to what in 2019 would have been 29 million children. Um, which means uh, every state and every family can count on these benefits. And I think that, uh, that that's the most critical aspect. It's also evidence-based. Uh, we know this work to reduce child food insecurity by a third. 
And we have more recent evidence from the Brookings Institution that also shows that these benefits make a core difference. So I think um, I'll just stop there because I think that's incredibly powerful in terms of what we'll be able to do with respect to summer hunger. Um, on your CACFP question, I'm so excited about the president's uh, proposed investment in childcare and um, particularly excited about the role CACFP can play. As you know, CACFP is an entitlement program, so it will be allowed to flex as childcare grows and we see more providers uh, in the system. Uh, we, we know CACFP can, can connect with them. But, but, and I think your bill is a perfect demonstration of this, there's a lot we can do to simplify the program and make it more appealing to the providers. So you have ideas around extending, uh, connecting the, the enrollment of the, the uh, sorry, the, 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 the providers that are in, um, reducing paperwork, we're, we think those are all terrific changes. And we wanna, we wanna make sure that we're reaching out to all new providers to, to connect them. I think your point about adding a third meal is gonna be very important for the committee to consider because one of the reasons we wanna see these investments in childcare is so that parents have a safe, um, secure place for their kids where they know their kids are well taken care of as they consider uh, job opportunities. And we don't want parents to have to forego a job where they might, um, might need an extra hour or two on the job uh, uh, if they're worried that their kids won't have supper. So I think it's a terrific proposal and I hope the committee looks at it. All right, let me keep going. Oh, uh, <laughs> WIC Farmers Markets, uh, it's a wonderful program and uh, we did need flexibilities in the past year uh, and appreciated uh, uh, the ability to offer those. An example of one was um, when we had new farmers markets wanting to come on board uh, that they were able to do, for example, remote training so that they, you know, that things didn't have to be in person. And I think that's just a key takeaway from this past year. And in fact, we see here in this committee hearing, there's a lot of work we can do and a lot of providers that we can reach now um, with using, um, using alternatives to exclusively in person. And I think that's a key learning we want to bring forward. And with the WIC 390 fund, we want to do, that. that's what we're calling, sort of the investment from the rescue plan uh, making sure that we're bringing along with farmers markets as an expanded resource to our WIC uh, participants will be a key part of what we're doing. So I hope that get, got to your questions. You did answer my, all of my questions with a couple of seconds to spare. Thank you very much. It's my understanding that the ranking member of the full committee, uh, Dr. Fox, will be next for five minutes. Uh, ranking member Fox, I recognize you for five minutes for your questions. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Ms. Dean, thank you for coming today. Um, the last 15 months have demonstrated the power of communities stepping up to help their neighbors and friends. And the Trump administration implemented the waiver authority granted to it to help ensure all students continue to have access to food. We also know that there are some changes that will continue after all students are back in school. Can you? and we want the students to be back in school, obviously. Can you briefly tell us about some of the changes that will continue in the school meal program, focusing on surface service and preparations? Sure, thank you, um, Congresswoman Fox, for that question. Uh, you point out one of the core flexibilities that the secretary wanted to be sure that schools had is that while we absolutely want all students back, and as a parent, I can underscore that, um, we, we aren't completely certain of what the public health requirements will be for congregate feeding. So will students be able to be in the cafeteria together? Are spacing required? What might they need to be uh, served lunch in the classroom? So one of the uh, core flexibilities that we're offering is the ability to serve meals in a non-congregate environment. Uh, we, we want schools to be able to pivot and flex to uh, circumstances as they unfold and as they may be specific to their communities. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, so I'm, I'm imagining I've been in schools lots of times where the students have picked up their lunches and taken them back into the classroom. So I'm assuming that's one of the flexibilities that they might have. Absolutely, that's a okay. Perfect. Okay, all right. 
So given some of these changes, I agree with my colleague, Mr. Foster, who said reauthorizing to the old way of doing things is not responsible legislating. We need to understand how these changes are working, what challenges schools are facing, how students are adapting to them. I hope the USDA will keep an open mind and listen to what's working and what is not before cementing any requirements in the law and regulations. Mrs. Dean, will you commit to ensuring USDA will work with us to include changes for the future and not just focus on old positions and understanding of how the program works in the schools? You absolutely have my commitment that we want to work with this committee uh, on, uh, on child nutrition policy. Great. Um, I'm in the classroom and in cafeterias when I'm in schools and I'm in schools a bit, good bit. Um, and I talk to the people working in the cafeteria. They're just among the most dedicated people in the world. So <clears throat> are you making a commitment uh, to have this program work in the future with the professionals on the ground? And those, almost all women who work in those cafeterias and food service uh, really want to do good for the students. So uh, will you commit to collaborating, consulting, and working with the doers in this program, those people serving the food, preparing the food, to help ensure it works for students, schools, and program partners? Yeah, absolutely. And that's not just for with respect to the standards that uh, we, we will be updating and setting, but also <coughs> with implementation. This, uh, this enterprise has... Um, a lot of different players in it, but first and foremost are, are those incredible, as you say, women on the ground of preparing and serving meals every day for right. us. You mentioned earlier evidence-based. That's an, it's a nice code word we hear a lot, but I'm very interested in accountability. You know, I asked the hardworking taxpayers to give up their money to bureaucrats in the federal government. And what they want is to know their money's being spent well. So what accountability measures are you putting in place to show that the summer programs particularly are having the desired effect of ensuring that uh, students are getting meals that they need? Well, that's a terrific question. I think just first, let me say the evidence is based off of a very robust uh, research evaluation that was done several years ago. But as we move forward for establishing this program through the American Families Plan, we have the opportunity to work together to ensure the appropriate accountability. So I look forward to working with your office on that as uh, the committee uh, uh, develops the final details of the summer EBT program. Well, we'll be back in touch with you with some suggestions on how we think that accountability should be um, developed. Thank sure. you very much, and I yield back. Thank you, um, Dr. Fox. I next recognize Dr. Adams for five minutes for your questions. Thank you, Chair Bonamici and Ranking Member Fulcher for hosting the hearing today, and thank you to our witness, Undersecretary Dean, for your testimony. Uh, this is an incredibly important topic. Hunger in our country has increased substantially during the COVID-19 pandemic. And thanks to the work of our committee on pandemic relief over the past year uh, and President Biden and Undersecretary Dean's work uh, implementing the important anti-hunger policies, the number of Americans struggling with hunger is now at its lowest level since the pandemic began. However, we've got a lot of work to do. Uh, Ms. Dean, uh, we know that healthy school meals are critical to children's health and academic achievement, but we also know that school nutrition staff need support to create meals that are healthy and enjoyable for children and to help children develop healthy uh, habits. In the American uh, Families Plan, the Biden administration proposed a billion dollars to provide additional support and incentives for schools to create a healthy school nutrition environment. Uh, my question to you is, why is this additional funding important, and what are some examples of ways that schools could use the proposed funding? Well, thanks for asking me that. Um, I, I think we are looking to spark that local innovation that several of you have already spoken about. Let's say, for example, a, and, and let me be clear, we, we do want to work with the committee on establishing what the standards would be for uh, qualifying for these additional funds. So it might be exceeding the standards, say, uh, with respect to one of the, the limits. It might be more physical activity. It might be thinking about 
an innovative way to integrate nutrition education, as the ranking member uh, mentioned, into the core curriculum. We, uh, we have several ideas, but I think uh, we want to hear from our, um, our school food leaders about what they think would spark the, the most innovation. And of course, from you all about the, the areas where we can uh, drive change with some financial incentives. Great, thank you. We, we know that WIC is, is critical uh, to improving maternal and infant health outcomes. And I appreciate the fact that the Biden administration has made WIC a key piece of its agenda to prevent maternal mortality, particularly for black indigenous and other women of color. So can you speak to some of the specific projects that your agency is working on to improve access to WIC and to help it play a bigger role in preventing uh, maternal mortality? Um, yes, thank you for that uh, question. So our fundamental goal is to connect more eligible families to WIC because it has uh, proven benefits with respect to uh, birth outcomes and uh, basic uh, child development, basic health and development for uh, young kids. So uh, we want to, we need to connect more eligibles. We want to improve the participant experience, um, potentially using a technology as a means to uh, streamline and make it easier to enroll as well as to use benefits and also see ways that we can streamline benefit delivery and service. So for example, connecting more effectively connecting with to uh, participants, healthcare providers so that records could be exchanged and we could reduce um, the cost and time for participants in the WIC clinic. All of this is oriented ar uh, around being a part of the administration's broader goals to address maternal mortality and uh, core racial disparities there. Okay. So we welcome your ideas on that front. One of the issues we've heard about from healthcare providers who see WIC patients is that the data is not always shared in an efficient manner between WIC and medical providers. So you know, what can we do to facilitate this exchange of information? Well, that's core to one of our to our goals is to make sure that uh, to the extent the participants want that data, that they give their permission, that we uh, we can make sure that it, we're sharing back and forth. So, um, uh, and we often hear that families show up at WIC clinics more frequently sometimes than um, than well baby visits, and this is a key way to get information back to uh, the doctors as well. So uh, that's top of mind for us, and we're meeting with HHS. Uh, as well as state health leads so that we can sort out what barriers stand in our way. Great, thank you very much. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adams. Next, I recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Fulcher, for five minutes for your questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mrs. Dean, thank you for joining us here today. There is a lot of stuff that you covered and a lot that we need to cover, but before I get to questions, I wanna just highlight one issue that I hope is behind us and will remain behind us. And it's critical that child nutrition programs meet their intended purpose and that in putting together those rules, the agency not hurt any state industries in those efforts. And a few, ago, a few years ago, you may recall, there was an attack on the white potato and being from Idaho, you might imagine, uh, there was a few people that lost their sense of humor over that. So uh, I hope that you will maintain the uh, white potato as an allowable under the school meal and WIC programs. And moving on to other issues, I think the cost in this program is also important to discuss. And I'll go on record and say that the reauthorization process, I believe should be budget neutral and focus on targeting benefits to those in need. However, I also think it's critical that these programs not include any unfunded mandates or hidden compliance costs to the schools. So Mrs. Dean, uh, do you recall what the proposed cost of the meal standards rule was back in 2011? I do not. It was it, it was over six billion dollars, and uh, the final cost estimate of that wound up being about three point two billion. And I'll just ask: Do you know why it was less than what the proposal was? No, I welcome you. It, it, it was it was because the implementation for the breakfast requirements was delayed. And so, and that was where, where there was a uh, uh, supposedly an attempt to get things healthier. The, the sodium and fat levels had been adjusted, but those rules got delayed. In fact, the rule, uh, the actual rule uh, was uh, stated as follows in the executive summary. Most notably, this final rule provides an additional time for implementation of breakfast requirements and the modifies those requirements in a manner that reduces the estimated cost of breakfast changes as compared to the proposed rule. And so as a result, the final rule estimated at 3.2 billion 
uh, over the course of five years. And so that was considerably of less. So that just, it states the, the true impact of uh, what was going on at that time. So just moving on, while the USDA noted other changes to help offset the cost of these regulations, the school groups have been very clear. These regulations added significant unreimbursed costs did not include the additional costs borne by schools such as labor and compliance costs. So uh, another question, Mr. Dean, I don't believe it's acceptable for the federal government to put requirements on schools that uh, add additional compliance costs. And I hope this time uh, around Secretary Vilsack will commit to limiting the negative impact on regulations. Will you make that commitment in terms of those costs on the schools? Well, Mr. Ranking Member, I think the, the goal of the standards uh, is to increase the health and quality of food that kids are eating, and we know it met those. We also know that the vast majority of schools were able to meet the standards. And so I, I think with respect to your question, we want to consider costs, uh, absolutely. Uh, the, the meal reimbursement, the meals have to be able to, um, uh, sorry, meet the cost within the reimbursement rate. But I'm not sure, I, th I feel like you're, uh, so I feel like all of those pieces will come into play as we move forward with setting the new standards and working on reasonable, feasible implementation. I'm trying to just point out that there truly is a, a cost to this and, and that cost does not necessarily bear improvement. And so uh, that's the point of going down that, that uh, line of, of questioning. So in your testimony, you highlighted the president's billion dollar proposal to create an incentive fund for healthy foods. Can you just give us a little bit more detail on how this proposed program interacts with the current requirements and meet the current standards and the regulations? And how can you ensure that this will be voluntary and not overly burdensome? Well, we do intend for it to be voluntary, to put out an incentive fund for districts. And just let me make sure I underscore this for you because uh, I'm not sure you understood that. It's for districts uh, to give them increased financial reimbursement if they, for example, want to meet a higher target with respect to healthy meals, perhaps uh, do something with respect to increased physical activity, change the way food is displayed in the lunch line to put healthier food first. Uh, we are, uh, the, I think the idea is we want to work with the committee to come up with what those innovative practices would be that we would help incent schools to adopt. And the whole idea here is to support local innovation and different local approaches with respect to okay. healthy standards. Okay. So, and, and so the, the point I'm trying to make is, is that, uh, it, please be careful of the burdensome bureaucracy that some of this can create because we do have to put this implementation on the ground. And with that, uh, my time is running out. Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you so much. I now recognize Representative Hayes for five minutes for your questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Deputy Undersecretary Dean for being with us today. This hearing could not come at a more important time. Over the past year, the state of Connecticut and our nation have faced a fierce battle with child food insecurity. While the COVID-19 pandemic put the gaps in our safety net for put gaps in our safety nets for parents and children on full display, it did not create them. As an educator, I can tell you that 2020 was not the first time children have gone hungry. Long before the onset of this pandemic, children in my classroom would put their heads on their desks because they hadn't had a meal for the day. Mothers utilizing WIC ran out of benefits mid-month and had to figure out how to scrape by. And millions of families who live paycheck to paycheck lined up weekly at food banks to make sure they had basic staples in their kitchens. So thank you, Undersecretary Dean, for being here today to discuss this crucial work at USDA to alleviate food insecurity and for the administration's prioritization of child nutrition in the American Families Plan. First, I would like to focus on the WIC participation. We know that the WIC program is highly effective at improving birth outcomes. Yet, we also know that many eligible women, infant, and children are not participating in this program. Ms. Dean, what ideas do you have about how to make it easier for families to participate in WIC? And what supports do you think that Congress needs to put in place to address this issue? Also, how can different programs share information to streamline the process for participation? Well, I'll give you two specific examples just building off of what you just said. So first off, uh, uh, pregnant, pregnant postpartum women, infants and children who are participating in Medicaid or SNAP are income eligible for WIC. So I think it's critical that we uh, uh, not just 
uh, make it so that if a participant shows up at a WIC clinic and shows their SNAP information that they can qualify, that we want to actually be doing aggressive, what we call in-reach to uh, households on SNAP and WIC who qualify for WIC but are not participating. That's a group of folks who have I, I self-identified as being at nutrition risk and in need of help with respect to health security. But we want to work to connect them over. And I think setting some cross-enrollment standards the way you've done from SNAP to school meals could really help uh, galvanize attention and focus on this issue at the state and federal level. And another quick example um, uh, would be is uh, we, we have very high participation amongst infants, but we see with participation trail off as the children get older. So we actually also need to be focusing on retention, not just outreach to newly eligible. So those are two examples of things we would love to work with you on, and we'll be using the funds you gave us uh, to spearhead efforts as well. Thank you. I'm currently working on legislation to make it easier for families to participate in WIC, and I look forward to working with this administration to make that a priority. Summer nutrition programs face a similar participation problem. In fact, in the most recent data available from USDA, only one in seven children who are eligible for free meals through the summer food participation program actually receive those meals in the summer. The American Families Plan proposes making the successful summer EBT uh, pilot program, a program in which families who are eligible for these meal benefits um, permanent. Ms. Dean, what impact do you anticipate the expansion will have on child hunger? Well, the evidence would suggest that it could reduce food, child food insecurity by 30% uh, to a third. So quite significant. And that, that is really the core motivation for doing this. It's an effective demonstrated approach uh, that we know will, or, or sorry, we're very confident will reduce child hunger. Thank you. I think we hear a lot from, from people here about practitioners on the ground. I am an educator by profession and 15 years I was in the classroom. I always had a summer program. We always had summer meals in the community. And I can tell you with fidelity, the impact that that has when parents and children were lined up around the corner before we even opened in the morning, because for many of them, that was the only meal they would get. And at lunchtime, those same families would come back and receive lunch. So um, this work is, is critical. It is important, it is necessary in our communities, and it is something that I look forward to partnering with the administration to make sure that our children are not hungry because it is not their fault, um, many of the situations that they're in. So with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you so much for your questions. And next I recognize Representative Fitzgerald for five minutes for your questions. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mrs. Dean, uh, thanks for being here today. Uh, as a member of Congress from uh, Wisconsin, you can uh, probably understand uh, my concerns about uh, WIC and its relationship to dairy, both uh, milk that's part of the program as well as uh, cheese. And uh, the sodium question continues to kind of pop up um, and the relationship to a total uh, diet that uh, most kids um, would would be given on on a daily basis. Um, if uh, it can lead some students, I think there's a there's kind of a question as to are the sodium limits too low, and and how are those going to be gauged uh, moving forward? That would be my first statement kind of question. So thank you for the question. It gives me an opportunity to make sure everyone knows that we will be updating the nutrition standards in the school meals program, as well as WIC, to reflect the new dietary guidelines. That's a process we need to undertake. Uh, it's also an important opportunity for us to rethink um, the uh, not just what the standards are, but the implementation timelines to get there. What the nutritionists at uh, FNS call me, this amazing group of people, um, it, as well as school food leaders, is that we need good, we need good, high quality standards that are uh, pushing all of us to advance. But we also need time to get there, and uh, that's how we'll uh, approaching this. But we need input from industry, from school food leaders, uh, from from dietitians, from the Heart Association, from across the board, 
so that we pull together the right standards with uh, practical and feasible implementation guidelines. And just to put on your radar screen, I'm sure you're aware of it, but uh, there seems to be questions about the level of uh, the whole grain requirement as well. Uh, that Yeah, that seems to be a, a concern. Um, the other thing would be uh, when you're looking at kind of school lunches and the variety, and, and I know that, uh, that Congressman Fulcher brought this up earlier, just the desire of, of some elementary students to, to want to uh, have that school lunch every day and whether or not it's desirable. Uh, I think it, it kind of goes back to um, whether or not the, the sodium and the variety uh, that's offered uh, in, in specifically milk products. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, you know, you'd have uh, two cartons of milk. One would be chocolate and one would be, would be uh, regular white milk and uh, whole milk, by the way. We didn't have 1% back then. Um, but, but moving forward, I think there's uh, kind of a desire again to, to make school lunches something that kids really want to, they look forward to and they, and they want to consume. And I would hope that that would be integrated into any of the decisions made with, with kind of the levels of uh, consideration for all of these items, so. Right, taste and appeal has got to be a critical part of this, but also is um, a knowing that we've got to push our kids to eat well. And, you know, the, the first time your child rejects a green bean or a Brussels sprout, you don't give up. And so I think that's, that's part of the balance here. Uh, it's taste and appeal as well as um, continuing to uh, offer healthy, nutritious food, uh, which will not just affect their health today, but their lifetime. Uh, in in the last minute that I have, uh, could you just talk a little bit about uh, farm to school that program and and how it's viewed and and kind of what the status is of it and and how do you see it moving forward? Because it's been a great success, I think. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. Farm to school, I think, is one of our most uh, most uh, successful and um, cherished programs from. Uh, from all corners of the country. It just does such a wonderful job connecting local producers to schools, teaching kids about where their food comes from, uh, helping schools meet their Buy America requirements, and of course, um, uh, fulfill the nutrition standards uh, with healthy, delicious food. So we would love to do more with that program and would be happy to work with the committee on addressing uh, uh, minor barriers that uh, can that, that can prevent uh, some schools from coming in, but it's it's wonderful success. We want to continue to grow it. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. And next, I recognize Representative Mervin for five minutes for your question. Good afternoon. I, uh, I thank you very much for your testimony, for your engagement. Uh, very quickly, my wife is a dietitian. I'm excited that we're talking about sodium intake and salt, uh, but most importantly, realizing that the goal is to remove obstacles for children to make sure that they're in an environment to learn and that they're properly fed and have nutrition. That being said, I also was a township trustee that provided poor relief to uh, over 180,000 individuals. And we worked very closely during the pandemic uh, with the school systems to make sure that those most vulnerable populations were able to receive meals uh, and even beyond. Uh, and what a difference that that made. So I want to, uh, among those thousands of families, I want to uh, thank you for that initiative and going forward and have participated uh, making sure families were aware of the summer programs. That being said, I'm, I'm grateful that we now have an administration that is committed to ending the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, but I do worry about the economic impacts of the COVID-19 uh, will be ongoing for many families. Um, Ms. Dean, what are some of the ongoing challenges uh, you think families will face when it comes to feeding their children over the next few years? And what can Congress do to ease that transition as children go back to school uh, in certain emergency relief programs, including the pandemic EBDT, uh, and when it starts to expire. Thank you very much for that question and for your leadership on, on it sounds like these issues for some time. You know, as the economy begins to recover, which will be wonderful, wonderful news, um, it's important to remember that uh, low-income households typically don't experience uh, economic improvement as quickly as the rest of the country. 
we may continue to see elevated unemployment and high rates of poverty. Uh, and so that often, for example, in, in my world shows up as continued elevated enrollment in SNAP. And that's just because uh, uh, economic recovery isn't always equally felt. This president is focused on making sure that this recovery is truly progressive and brings along the whole country. And some of the things that uh, he believes will help achieve that are in the families plan and the jobs plan. So making a strong childcare so that uh, all parents know uh, that their kids are um, healthy and safe mm -hmm. without uh, looking for work, stronger unemployment insurance program, uh, continued um, support through SNAP. Uh, these, are, these are the kinds of wraparound, as well as paid leave, right? These are the kinds of wraparounds that will help bring strong economic recovery for everyone. And I appreciate your focus on the fact that not everyone will uh, experience um, the uh, economy snapping back quite as quickly. And we need to be mindful of that. I thank you very much for your testimony and for your commitment to the school children. And with that, I yield back Chairwoman. Thank you very much. Next, I recognize Representative Sparks for five minutes for your questions. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I have a question for Ms. Dean related to some, as a former auditor to some fraud and audits. So as I look up in 2019, Government Accountability Office cited USDA for not assessing fraud risk comprehensively and on compliance with the fraud risk framework. We also, they also noted the high estimated improper payment error rates and vulnerability to fraud. So this is a program with high risk of fraud. And my question is for you, now you're asking, you know, 45 billion more for expenditure on this program. So I would like to know what processes you are implementing to make sure your compliance with fraud risk framework, framework and you have proper control to address the risk of fraud. Thank you very much for the question, Congresswoman. Uh, you raised a critical point, right? The, the public's trust in us um, is uh, critical to me and knowing that taxpayer dollars are going for their intended purpose is critical. Uh, just it is a core component of what we need to do and how we wanna design these programs. So what one of the things that's um, wonderful about the summer EBT program is because it will pivot off of uh, enrollment in other programs, for example, SNAP, that does an incredibly robust and rigorous assessment of eligibility, we have a high degree of confidence about uh, eligibility for those benefits. And of course, we know that families are using those benefits uh, for food. So I think we feel very good about that, but would have, be happy to work with the committee. And let me also say, um, one other thing that you, you um, our budget isn't out yet. Uh, that'll be coming forthcoming in a couple of weeks. But one of the things I want to do at FNS is we absolutely need to increase our staff, our extraordinary group of uh, people here. Federal spending on, um, on the nutrition programs has grown significantly while our staff has shrunk. And that compromises our ability to oversee these programs. And I, I wanna lean in and acknowledge that and ask for the resources we need to steward these programs to the high degree uh, that the public and you expect. So generally, if you say you're planning to implement, I want to confirm because government can build office said that they recommend for food and nutrition services should establish a processes who administer them to plan and conduct regular fraud risk assessment for the school meals program that align with leading practices in the fraud risk framework. So are you planning to perform this regular assessments of fraud risk and internal procedures to make sure that you comply with that framework? So we have fairly regular assessments on program integrity, but since I'm not tracking to the specific uh, the, uh, the specific issue that you're raising, can I follow up with you on that to yeah, make sure? Yeah, I will. Right. I just want to make sure because I wanted to see we ha they haven't released uh, the recent what's happening in 2020. That was a review of 2019. But since we're looking to expand even further some of these programs, we need to make sure that we have proper procedures and controls in place and you are complying with uh, fraud risk assessment framework that Government Accountability Office requires all other agencies to. So I would be happy to follow up with you and make sure that we have this, you have these processes and have it on your radar too. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'll follow up. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. I now recognize Representative Bowman for five minutes for your question. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Uh, Ms. Dean, thank you so much for appearing before us today. Um, I represent the 16th District of New York, which includes parts of the Bronx and parts of Westchester. I'm hearing directly from my constituents who qualify for SNAP that they're experiencing problems with applying for and receiving benefits. One recurring piece of feedback I get is that the once a month distribution of benefits creates problems at the end of the month when they have already expended the majority of or all of their benefits. In addition to increasing the SNAP benefit, what kind of administrative costs would be associated with distributing benefits on a bi-weekly basis so that the pacing reflects a more realistic pattern for getting food throughout the month? Well, thank you, interesting question. Um, so I think the statute, the SNAP statute actually uh, prohibits uh, splitting issuance in, into two, uh, wanting to give the control to households on how they manage and budget their funds. Um, but I, I think, so I think the core issue uh, is making sure that households have a, a benefit that um, is sufficient. And so you're uh, giving me the opportunity to um, uh, just remind folks that the secretary at Congress's direction uh, has asked us to reevaluate SNAP's thrifty food time, the basis for the basic benefit to ensure that it is an adequate level to purchase a healthy uh, diet with respect to um, the uh, dietary guidelines and also to sort of consistent with current prices and consumer spending patterns. So we hope to wrap that process up this summer. And, and it's my hope that uh, households, when households have a realistic uh, uh, benefit that will allow them to access nutritious food that we will, will take away some of this poor stress and, and this end of month crisis. Thank you. Um, also, uh, the enacted COVID relief packages to date have been responsive to the dramatic increase in food insecurity experienced by children and families this past year. But that combined investment has not been sufficient to end food insecurity overall. Tens of millions of families are struggling today to feed themselves. As a former educator and principal myself, I know that if a child is hungry, they can't focus on learning in the classroom. What level of investment would be necessary is necessary to permanently end domestic food insecurity? Hmm. That's a big question. I think, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but I do think that a big part of it, it uh, is not just with respect to food assistance. And you as an educator probably could tell me more about families need, uh, they need uh, good paying jobs. They need access to health and co coverage so that they're not choosing between paying medical bills and feeding their kids. And they need affordable, safe places to live. So I think that's a big part of why the families plan, the jobs plan, and the rescue plan together are trying to deal with the conditions that cause people to be hungry. And I think that's the better way. That, along with a strong economy and good paying jobs, is the right pathway forward to addressing hunger. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I yield back. Thank you very much. Now we're going to hear from the chairman of the full committee, Congressman Scott. I recognize you for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ms. Dean, for being with us today. We heard about that code word evidence-based. I was just wondering if we can count on you to make your decisions based on evidence rather than slogans and sound bites. Always. I am an analyst at heart. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. Um, the community eligibility program you, you mentioned that uh, decreases paperwork and administrative costs, um, helps families who fall just outside the uh, eligibility limits, um, removes the stigma for some children to have to go through paperwork, others don't. Um, the, um, you mentioned that about 9 million additional children <coughs> will be covered by uh, community eligibility. How close are we getting to uh, universal coverage for um, um, school meals? Um, we've had uh, proposals from uh, members of the committee to uh, just um, serve everybody. Are we getting close? Uh, thanks for asking. I think with the American Families Plan proposal, we would reach, we believe we'd reach about half of our nation's schools. Unfortunately, half of our nation's schools are high poverty schools where they're serving a significant share of low-income children. And I think we hit about 45% of the kids. So- um, With this, community eligibility. Through and, just, then the re and then the rest have to go through paperwork to get qualified. So the, we would only be adding on 
um, a um, we're getting close to where we can add the more it would be affordable just to do everybody. So uh, well, that, just, just keep that just keep that in mind. Um, on the um, um, automatic eligibility, can you talk about how valuable that is? Um, if you have Medicaid or if you've got SSI, you're automatically qualified. You don't have to do all the paperwork. You don't have to go find records and everything. How helpful is that? I'd love to talk about that. So the way it works right now is mostly through SNAP. And, and imagine a mom who uh, goes and applies for SNAP, which is a very rigorous process. It can take hours. They have to turn in paperwork. There's an interview. She's self-identified as food insecure and in need of help. And so the way the law works now is in, in applying for SNAP, if she has school-aged children, they're automatically picked up and enrolled into free school meals. And that's the right, I think that's the right values. And that's that's government helping someone in need. Uh, the, what the American Families Plan would do is propose to extend that to Medicaid and SSI, where again, parents are going through an incredibly rigorous process. And it seems to me government is at its best when it's offering them that additional help, passporting those kids over to free school meals. It also uh, increases program integrity. So it's a wonderful way to connect folks to the meals program. Good, thank you. Um, the pandemic uh, EBT um, we extended was extended through the end of the public health emergency. We're aware that 40 states have already gotten qualified for K through 12. 22 states have done children under six. What is the agency doing to make sure that uh, all of the states get qualified as soon as possible? I have an update on that. We're actually up to 43 school uh, states with school plans and 24 on child care. Uh, my team has to report in to me um, basically every two days on where we're at and uh, with every state that where we haven't got where it's submitted but not approved or it hasn't yet been submitted. Uh, I, I'm aware of exactly where it is because we intend to get to all, all states. Good. Um, you said the majority of the school districts comply with the school nutrition standards. Uh, what, did you, what does majority mean? You know, I would need to get back to you with the exact number, but we have a we have an it's assessment. Very, it's virtually it's virtually all of them, isn't yeah, it? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It is virtually. Uh, okay. Um, the uh, in in plate waste where students are not eating the food, uh, have you found that to be no worse with good nutrition than with bad nutrition? Uh, it's actually. Uh, less bad with good nutrition. We see increased intake of, of vegetables and dairy and good, good healthy food uh, and less plate waste overall relative to the food that kids bring from home. Uh, so the, the districts aren't having problems complying and the children are getting better nutrition uh, would suggest that we don't need to um, dilute the uh, nutrition standards, seems to me. It would absolutely suggest that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Chairman Scott. Now I recognize uh, Representative Lebjer Fernandez for five minutes for your questions. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And congratulations, Ms. Dean, on your appointment. I look forward to working with you. Uh, as I noted, I'm from uh, New Mexico and have uh, many tribes in my district. So we'll wanna touch on those issues a little bit later. But I really am grateful for the decision to expand uh, until 2022 and the idea of enrolling more schools and perhaps expanding the community program so that we avoid that paperwork. I hear about that often. You know, my, my state has uh, a majority of Title I schools, but I wanna talk a little bit about lunch shaming, you know, which will happen if we don't get to more universal uh, provision of school lunches. And as you know, and as the committee knows, that's a practice of embarrassing or singling out children who can't afford uh, the school lunch that day. Um, and you know, in 2010, Congress did address the, address the USDA and ask them to provide a response. Um, there were several fact sheets that the USDA has issued, one of which was entitled Meal Charges Fact Sheet which I'm gonna quote says, USDA requires school food authorities to develop and communicate a policy for handling unpaid meal charges, but allows local officials to define how that policy works. Uh, in another fact sheet, uh, the Preventing Lunch Shaming Communication Strategies, 
it simply says that USDA discourages um, the use of hand stamps, stink, stickers, etc. cetera. Um, I would like to, uh, 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 I ask unanimous consent to uh, put these documents into the record, Madam Chair. Without objection. So um, I, I wanted to ask you whether USDA currently has a policy that explicitly prohibits lunch shaming or is it merely guidance to discourage the practice? We require the locals to have a policy. So as you, I think you, you actually accurately described our policy. Um, and I, you know, I, I would really like to work with the committee so that we can do better. Uh, children should not be uh, put in the middle of this problem. And uh, that's, that's just unacceptable. And we, we need to see if there's a way that we can uh, develop a, a framework uh, so that districts just don't do that. I really appreciate hearing that, you know, I had the example of the little Alabama child who was stamped with, I need money for my lunch. And I take it you would agree that that is unacceptable. Yes, uh, as, yes, in my position and as a parent, yeah, I feel that way very strongly. Um, so it, it is tricky and we need to, we need to sort out how to do it, but uh, we, we would look forward to working with you on that. I, I look forward to working with you as well. I will be reintroducing the Anti-Lunch Shaming Act to prohibit, not simply discourage, but actually prohibit schools from publicly stigmatizing a child who can't afford their lunch. Uh, and, uh, you know, as you pointed out, school hunger is an issue and it's not the child's fault and we need to take care to not put that blame on the child. Uh, I wanted to move a bit to the issue of uh, tribal nutrition programs. Um, as you are aware that there are some limitations on the ability of tribes to uh, administer the food assistance programs. Um, I am going to be looking at introducing the Tribal Nutrition Improvement Act to make sure that tribes can administer the food assistance programs directly. In my experience, I worked with tribes for 30 years. Self-determination, we have found out, works really well. Uh, but can you describe uh, what actions the Department of Agriculture is taking to ensure tribes that have been really hit hard by the pandemic? Um, what actions is USDA taking right now to assist with these uh, nutrition programs and, and allowing the tribes to have the control they need? Well, well, thank you for the question. And I know that my staff and your staff have been talking about that bill. So I look forward to um, the next steps on that. Um, first off, the USDA has held, I believe, um, two formal consultations uh, across the agency to hear from tribes just to begin to renew our relationship and to um, to do it in a way that respects tribal sovereignty. Um, we've held tribal consultation with respect to the food distribution program on Indian reservations, which is a tribal alternative to SNAP. And I've also done specialized stakeholder listening. So one, it just begins with hearing what the issues are and where and how our programs are being responsive. There's been a, a significant amount of um, uh, targeted assistance provided to tribes, which I can follow up with you on. Uh, but uh, clearly there's more we can do, particularly with respect to the way the relationship works. I look forward to uh, that ongoing communication and thank you for listening to the tribes. Uh, my time is up, I yield back. Thank you. I see no other members for questions. So I want to now remind sure. my colleagues that, was there another member? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, uh, this is uh, Congressman Fulcher. I just wanted to, to if, if there was an opportunity for a closing statement, I'd like yes, to make that we'll, but when the time Yes, right. we, we will get to that. I just want okay. to make sure we got all the members for questions. Great. Thank uh, you. I do want to remind, you're welcome. I do want to remind my colleagues that pursuant to committee practice, materials for submission to the hearing record must be submitted to the committee clerk within 14 days following the last day of the hearing. So by close of business on May 26, 2021, preferably in Microsoft Word format. Materials submitted must address the subject matter of the hearing. Only a member of the subcommittee or an invited witness may submit materials for inclusion into the hearing record. Documents are limited to 50 pages each. Documents longer than 50 pages will be incorporated into the record via an internet link that you must provide to the committee clerk within the retired time frame. But please recognize that in the future, that link may no longer work. Pursuant to House Rules and Regulations, items for the record should be submitted to the clerk electronically by emailing submissions to edandlabor.hearings at mail.house.gov. 
Again, I want to thank the witness for your participation today. Members of the subcommittee may have some additional questions for you. Uh, we ask you to please respond to those questions in writing. The hearing record will be held open for 14 days to receive those responses. I remind my colleagues that pursuant to committee practice witness questions for the hearing record must be submitted to the majority committee staff or committee clerk within seven days. The question submitted must address the subject matter of the hearing. And I now recognize the distinguished ranking member for a closing statement. You're muted, Mr. Fulter. Okay, I have a touchy uh, mute button, and I've so I uh, apologize about that. But thank you for uh, for recognizing me, Madam Chair. Uh, I have a report in front of me uh, from the uh, American Enterpri Enterprise Institute: Reimagining School Meals for Post-Pandemic Era. I would just like to uh, to enter that into the report, if I may, please. Without objection. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Deputy Undersecretary Dean, thank you for joining us today. I just wanted to recap a couple of the points that were made uh, today or that were brought up. First of all, just how important it is to whatever we have, that it's able to work actually on the ground. And it works for our hardworking school officials just because if it's not uh, easy to implement, it's not going to be successful anyway. We talked about strong accountability for these programs and the support for better nutrition education. That's just good for everyone. There was a hesitation on on uh, a commitment to to limiting the costs that schools will face. That's a super sensitive button, especially in my state and a lot of the Western states. And just to underscore why, uh, we struggle with our school funding probably more than most states do simply because uh, most of our land mass is federally owned. We don't have a broad-based property tax, which is a tool to often fund those mechanisms. There are other things that have been put in place, but nevertheless, it's just not the same as having a broad-based property tax. So this, the cost is very, very sensitive. So our schools face uh, enough challenges without uh, adding to cost and unfunded mandates on that front. So um, we did hear some positive news about uh, just the commitment to work with us on these proposals so that it doesn't get too layered and too complex. And so thank you for that. And just lastly, uh, Madam Chair and, and Mrs. Dean, uh, Congressman Fitzgerald from Wisconsin uh, made a, a, uh, I think some really good points. And in my state of Idaho, yes, we're known for potatoes, but we've got a strong dairy presence as well. And recently Secretary Vilsack said that um, in ag subcommittee that the uh, uh, kids are not drinking the no fat milk, but they are drinking the low fat milk. And uh, so I just wanna point that out. It's, it's, uh, it's important to have something that will actually be consumed and enjoyed. Uh, schools in my district have expressed concern also about uh, the USDA, USDA guidelines being uh, not particularly clear or flexible. And so any help that you can help us with on that uh, would be much, much appreciated. And uh, the the need to continue to serve low fat, low fat flavored milk is just very, very important. With that, Madam Chair and Mrs. Dean, I thank you for the time for this hearing. I yield back. Thank you very much. And I now recognize myself for the purpose of making a closing statement. Deputy Undersecretary Dean, thank you again for being with us and for dis discussing the work that you and the Biden administration have done and will continue to do to expand access to the child nutrition programs. We look forward to working with you. Our discussion today was a stark reminder of the scale and severity of the child hunger crisis. And even as we recover from the pandemic, parents and families still face steep challenges putting food on the table. And without nutritious food, too many children are losing the critical foundation they need to succeed in school, lead a healthy life and thrive. But today, we also confirmed that the early relief we secured for school nutrition, for child nutrition programs took significant steps in the right direction. These investments help put healthy food into the hands and the bellies of millions of children. As we learned last week, hunger is now at its lowest since the pandemic began. We cannot abandon this meaningful progress. As elected leaders, we have the opportunity and truly the moral obligation to make sure that our nation's children do not go hungry, but we cannot fulfill that responsibility 
unless we come together to support the vital nutrition programs that are now sustaining millions of, of children. I'm very encouraged by the ranking members' recognition of the importance of these nutrition programs. I do recall in prior hearings over the years, learning from those experts on the ground in the schools who are successfully implementing programs, for example, under the Healthy Hungry Free Kids Act standards. I look forward to the conversations about these, about the farm to school program and all of the other issues that we discussed today. So Deputy Undersecretary Dean, we do look forward to working with you to make sure that the American Families Plan builds on our progress to expand nutrition assistance while also supporting our local farmers. And I look forward to working with all my colleagues, colleagues to provide our children with nutritious food that will fuel their health and development. If there is no further business, without objection, I yield back and the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.